Hello everybody, welcome to Totally Tabled. My name is Shaggy, and today I'm doing a full solo playthrough of Endless Winter Paleo Americans. This is a big game with a lot of setup, so I've just gone ahead and done all that right up front. You want to set up as if you were playing a two-player game. So we got our eight sacred stone tiles over there. We shuffled up our animal deck and we have three animals, one per player plus one. We have our stacks of five different tribe cards. Each of those stacks has multiple copies of the same card. And then we also have eight random era one culture cards. These will form a little market over here. Now I've got our random map all set up. For the solo player, instead of using their normal deck of cards, you're gonna take the solo action deck, shuffle it up. You're then gonna form their sacrifice deck by taking five random era two culture cards, shuffling those up, and then taking five random era one culture cards, shuffling those up and putting it on top. You also wanna give them a random animal and just a random character to play. It doesn't matter, they're not gonna use the character's special ability. You then wanna shuffle up this deck of map cards, reveal one, and place the solo opponent's five tenths out on the board according to the map. The solo player also gets to be first player, so you put their turn order track marker on the top space. We go one space below. Place the elephant on the first round. And I'm gonna be playing as Chief Chiselstone today. Each of these chief cards is two-sided, so you can pick which side you want. I've chosen the two food side. And I drew a random setup card, which gave me two tools, one food, these two specific animals, and a shaman tribe card into my deck. I shuffled up my deck. I now get to draw a hand of five cards. It's my starting hand. And because we're second player, we get an extra food. And there we go. We're all set up and ready to start playing. Now there's a lot to explain here, but as usual, I'm going to explain it as we play. So let's not waste any more time. Let's just jump right in. As I said, our solo opponent is first, and on their turn, all you do is you take the top card of their action deck, you flip it over. Each of these four columns corresponds to the four different board actions that you can take. So we just look at where the meeple is, and that's the action that the AI wants to take. So we just take their worker, and we place it here at the bottom of that action spot. Now, rather than doing the action on the board, instead, they're gonna do the action that's shown in their little column. And there's gonna be a bunch of symbols that relate to different actions, and it's all in the solo rule book. I'm not gonna explain all the icons right now, we'll just explain them as we encounter them. So that first icon is a monolith action. We're actually building megaliths, not monoliths? Those are two very different things. Okay, maybe not very different, they're actually quite similar, but... Still, get it right. So we're gonna go to the monolith board. You're just gonna keep saying monolith this whole playthrough, aren't you? <sighs> idiot. Right now, there's no other pieces, so they have to play into one of those middle four starting areas. And in those areas, you can only use one of your gray monoliths. So which of those four starting areas are they gonna go into? We have to check this arrow on the side of their card. The big arrow is pointing to the right, which means they're gonna take the rightmost spot, which would be that one. And as you can see, there's another monolith icon on the spot, which means they get to take another monolith action, but it can only go into one of those two adjacent spots. Now you gotta, you gotta build your monoliths from left to right. So they're gonna take their other gray. And again, we're gonna consult the arrow because we have two choices. Both of them are equally to the right. So now we're gonna look at the tiny little arrow, the secondary arrow, it's pointing down. So they're gonna take the southernmost spot, which will be that one. And they covered up two food icons, so they get two food. So there we go. That was their first action, the monolith action. Right below that, that icon means they're going to bury a card. And that's super simple. You just take the top card from their sacrifice deck and you put it underneath the burial card. And there we go, we're all done. That is the first action of our solo opponent. Okay, now it's our turn. And the first thing that we get to do during this action phase is we can play a culture card from our hand. 
Now there are two types of cards, right? We have our tribe cards over here. They have the labor symbol in the upper left. And then we have culture cards, which show an era symbol, either era one or era two. Well, right now we're in era one and we managed to draw two culture cards. And right now we can play one of them. And I think I will. I think I'm going to play this one. And the action of this card is pretty simple. We can just spend a tool in order to take a monolith action, which I think I want to do. So we just spend our tool like that. And now we can do something similar to what the uh, AI did. Now we could also go to one of those middle spots with our gray, or we can just go adjacent to monoliths that have already been placed. I'm gonna go right here. And that's gonna let us place a second one out and get two food. Now we could play a second culture card if we wanted to, but in order to do so, we'd have to discard a card from our hand. So I don't think I wanna do that right now. I think I'm just gonna play the one and move on. Now we get to place our worker and we can place again in one of these four worker placement spots on the board. We also have a spot here where we can place a worker to rest and we get a little bonus as well, which I'll explain later. Right now though, I want to go to this spot right here because I see something on the board here that is really interesting to me and I wanna try to take advantage of it. Now, after you play a worker to a spot, you can then play any number of your tribe cards from your hand to generate different special abilities and mostly to generate labor so that you can then take these actions. For the action that I want to take, I'm going to need a bunch of labor. So I am going to play these two, my tribeswoman and my brave. Now, if you look at the top of the card here, you can see my brave is giving me one and a half labor and in addition, an additional labor. So right now he's giving me two and a half labor. You ignore this bottom part with that eclipse symbol. That would only apply if we were playing these cards during the eclipse phase, which you'll see very shortly. My tribeswoman is giving me one and a half labor as well, but also giving me this special ability here, which is I can spend a food in order to get a tool. And I would like to do that. So I'm gonna spend a food in order to get a tool. Now, if we add up the labor here, two and a half plus one and a half, I'm getting four labor from these cards that I've played. If I wanted additional labor, I could spend food. You can see the little labor symbols on top. Anytime you pass one of those symbols, you get an extra labor. So I could spend a food here cross that labor symbol, get a fifth labor if I wanted. But I think four is all I'm gonna need. Now we can come to this worker placement spot. And for the moment, we're only gonna look at the upper part of the space, that part that's in white. And you can see there, there are two different actions. One of the actions says we can spend tools in order to put out huts. And then the second one there shows we can spend one labor in order to move a hut one space. And the cool thing about these top actions is we can do this as much as we want. And so I think I wanna spend all my tools. I have two tools, I'm gonna to spend both of them to put out two huts. And when you put out huts, they go into the center camp space. Now I wanna spend all four of my labor to get four moves. And I'm gonna do it like this. And there we go. I've did all four of my moves, I've spent all four of my labor. So I'm now done with these upper actions. Once you've done that, you move your worker down to the second area. And now I have another action that I can take, but I can only take it once. And this says that I can spend three food in order to take three of my adjacent tents and form a village. And that is precisely what I want to do. So I'm gonna spend my three food, which is all of my food, so I've completely wiped out my resources, but I now get to place this village between my adjacent three tents. When you do that, you remove your tents and place them back on your board, like so. Now I did that for several reasons. One is we're doing a little bit of area control on this map. 
each tent is giving us one control of a hex, one power. But our village gives two power to each of the three hexes that it touches. So I now have two control of all three of those hexes, which is great. Now, what's so great about that is when you control a hex, you get to take a special action during the eclipse phase. And once again, you'll see that when we get there very shortly. The other cool thing is by removing these pieces from your board, you're unlocking extra actions, again, that will happen during the eclipse phase. So that was very cool. Now that we've taken that action, again, you can only do that once, we move down to this last spot, which is a bonus action that you get to take if you're the first person to take that action. And this one says we can place a tent and then move it one space. So we're gonna place that tent there and now we have to think about where we want to move that. Where do we want our next village to be? We have a lot of these um, glacier spaces, which are kind of not the best spaces and they're kind of all over the place there. Have a couple of good spots down there. Maybe I'll go over there. I'm gonna move that to that space for now. Now that I've done that, my worker is covering up that sort of bonus action. Now, if anyone else comes here in this round to take that action, they're not gonna get to do that bonus action. Just like if I come here, I'm not gonna be able to do the bonus action for that first action. So there you go, that was my first turn. You take your cards that you've played, you move them over to your discard pile, and boom, we're done. Okay, back to the AI. You flip the card. Now you don't cover up the card that they played previously. Not completely. You always leave that bottom column. So each turn and around, they're gonna take one extra action. Ooh, okay, so we have an interesting situation here. The solo opponent wants to come to this action space, but I've already gone there. And as long as there are open actions available that no one has taken yet, the solo opponent's going to want to do those instead. They always want to do an action that no one has done first. So in this case, we have two of them. So again, we're going to look at the arrow to see which one they would rather take. In this case, the big arrow is pointing to the left, so they're going to come over here. So now we're going to look at that column, that second column, <laughs> rather than the one where the meeple is, and we're going to do those three actions. That top icon means that they're going to attempt to build a village. They're going to attempt to do what I did, essentially. So we look at the map and we see if they have three tents that um, are together. And right now they don't have three tents that are surrounding a village spot. And so they can't build a village. So instead what they're going to do is relocate their tents. So what you do is you flip the top card and you only look at the inner ring. We're going to basically move the two tents that are in the inner ring to those new locations. And there we go. That's all they're going to do right now. But as you can see, the next time they take that action, they will be set up to build a couple villages. Okay, so now we're going to look at the second one, and that is take a sacred stone. So let's go up and we'll look at our eight sacred stones up there. Because we're in the first era, we can only select sacred stones from those first four. Once we get to rounds three and four, we'll unlock all the sacred stones. So we're just looking at those. Again, we're gonna look at the arrow. It wants to take the leftmost sacred stone. It's gonna put it in its leftmost location, which shows the cost, which is one tool and one food. And as you can see, it does not have a tool. So it cannot afford to take this. It has to be able to afford to place it. Now, when your solo opponent gets an action that it can't take, you refer to this card here, which has a little chart of all the actions. And right now you see there's the take the sacred stone icon. This means that when it can't do that, it will instead do that. And we've seen that icon before. That's the monolith icon. So instead of taking a sacred stone, because it can't afford it, it's going to place a monolith token. Once again, we're going to look at the arrow of all the available spots for it to take. So all of those areas that are adjacent to those stones that are already out there, 
it wants to place in the furthest left spot. And there's only one spot available because it's out of gray stone, so it can't place in that spot. Only grays can go in those middle spots. So instead, it's going to place right here. And get two food. And now, interestingly, it wants to do the sacred stone action again. It cannot because it didn't get a uh, tool there, so it's going to do another monolith. It still wants to go furthest to the left, and it has two options now. We look at the little arrow, which is pointing up, so it's going to take that spot. Now that icon is saying to take a tribe card and to put it into your discard pile. Now our solo opponent doesn't do that, and you can see here on the chart, it says, nope, it won't do that action. Instead, when it could do that action, it gets a tool instead. So there we go. That was all three of the solo opponent's actions. They're done. Okay, it's our turn, and we have no food, no tools, and only two cards in our hand. One which is a culture card, which we can't use because you'd have to spend food in order to get a tribe into our discard pile. So we're not going to play any culture. We have this one tribesman, which was just going to give us one labor. I think what we want to do, because we're so short-handed, because we've sort of put everything into that village, I am going to rest. So this is sort of the fifth worker placement spot. It's on your board here, and you get something for doing it. You get to draw a card from your deck into your hand. Ooh, let's see what we got. Another tribesman, okay. And then you can tap one of your animals. And I think I will. I'm going to tap this guy right here. And you can see down here, it tells you what you get when you tap it. In this case, I'm getting three food. One, two, three. And that little icon there means you get to move your idol up one. Now we have two idols on the idol board. There's sort of two tracks we're moving up. I'm going to move up the right hand track, which is the honor track. That track is going to affect how many points we get at the end of the game for buried cards. And again, I'm going to explain all that in a little bit. Now, when you tap one of your animals, you're not going to be able to use it to create sets of animals, which will give you points at the end of the game. Instead, we got a little bit of a benefit. Now, this resting worker will also give us a little bit of benefit during the eclipse phase. So you'll get to see that. Let's see what our opponent wants to do. Well, it honestly doesn't matter where the meeple is. There's only one spot that hasn't been taken, so they're going to take it. This is the hunting action. So we're going to go to that far right column. That first icon means they're just going to take the top card from the animal deck and keep it. The second icon is they're going to take one of these culture cards. And again, we consult the arrows. Looks like we're looking at the rightmost and then the bottommost. So that would be this culture card right here. And they just add that to the top of their sacrifice deck. Then their third and their fourth action there are basically the same. Each of those icons means they're going to add a card to their eclipse pile. So this first one, they're going to add two cards to their Eclipse pile. And that last one is another card. So they're adding three of these cards to their Eclipse pile. I'm just going to put it right here. The solo opponent adds cards to their Eclipse pile in a different way than we do. But those will come into effect during the Eclipse phase. And there we go. That's all that they're doing. That's their three actions for this round. We're going to play over four rounds. So you only get 12 actions in this game. Now let's go to our final action. Okay, first things first, we can play a culture card. I think I will. I have these communal feasts. So this says I can spend a food in order to take a tribe card and add it to my discard pile. So which of these tribe cards do I want? I think I'll take the crafter. Okay, and now I have one more worker left and it happens to be my chief. And your chief gives you a special ability, and in the case of Chief Chiselstone here, you can get two food if your chief takes that particular action, which happens to be the develop action. So I think I will do that. I'm going to put her there, and she'll immediately get two food. 
And now we can take the first top part of that action, which is we can spend three labor in order to get a culture card. And again, remember on these top actions, you can do them as many times as you want. And I actually would like to do this twice. So I'm gonna play two labor. I have these two tribesmen. All they do is give us one labor each. And then I'm gonna spend four food. And in this case, pass over four labor icons in order to get six labor, which means I can take two culture cards. Fantastic. So which of these do we want? I seem to be having trouble getting tools. And so I will take this right here, this torchlight. This is actually gonna go into my hand. And for the second culture card, we definitely have some interesting ones here. We have discard a card in order to take a monolith action and get a food. Here you could discard a card in order to place a tent and then move a tent two spaces and get a food. Now I think I'll do with this one, tanning hides. Add a tribe card to the discard pile and get a tool. So we'll have plenty of tools next round, that'll be good. Unfortunately, since I didn't have a tool this round, I can't get a sacred stone, which is what I was hoping to do. And so we'll just have to ignore that. And because someone already went there, we can't take that third ability. So that's really all we get to do with our final action. So we'll just discard these. And now that everyone has played all their workers, we finally get to do the eclipse phase. The first thing we get to do is form our Eclipse pile from the cards in our hand. Now, unfortunately, I only have culture cards in my hand, which don't do anything during the Eclipse phase. It's really only the tribe cards that do anything, so I'm not gonna really be able to form an Eclipse pile. We now reveal the Eclipse piles to see how much labor we have put into them. The AI creates their Eclipse pile with these actions throughout the round, unlike us that do it all at the end. So we just flip over what they've done there and we look at the top corner to see how much labor they have. You can see here they have one, two, and a half. And then you also include the top card that they, that the last one that they played of their actions deck there. So that's a half. So they have a total of three labor. Now our person who rested, they actually contribute one and a half labor to this eclipse phase, but unfortunately that's still less than three. So that means that our solo opponent stays in first place and we stay in second. If we had had more labor, then we would have been able to be first. Now that the new turn order has been established, we get eclipse benefits and we do this in turn order. So the first benefit you get is from the turn order track itself. So you can see there to the right, the player in first place can place a monolith token, or you could also choose to take any of the benefits that are below it. But our AI opponent, which is called the Nomad, by the way, I forgot about that. <laughs> I should be referring to them as the Nomad. So the Nomad is going to do an Eclipse action. And again, we consult the last card that they played in order to look at the arrows. So we're looking at the rightmost spot and the lowest spot. The lowest spot of the rightmost spots. That's going to be that space right there. And the reward they're going to get is a random animal card. They then get rewards for the hex tiles that they have the most influence on, or tied for the most. So they have two tents there on those glacier spots, so those don't provide anything. That water spot is going to give them one point. And those other two spots are giving them two idols. Now the Nomad always moves up the right track, the honor track, first. If they reach the top of that track, then they'll move up the other track. Now you get Eclipse bonuses that are on your board. If they had any Sacred Stones, they would get two points for each of them, rather than what's depicted on the Sacred Stone. They don't have any Sacred Stones. They have uncovered that spot right there, though, so that's going to give them a tool. And there we go. Those are their benefits. Now we get our benefits. So beside our marker is we get to draw a card. So, yeah, let's do that. We're tied in that idle spot, so we get one idle. And I too want to continue up that honor track. When you move into the same location as someone else, you just move to the right of them. So the idle that's in the leftmost spot got there first. They're 
considered to be ahead. They're breaking the tie for that spot, essentially. And now we are in control of those three there with our village. So we're just getting two points for that one. But we're on two spaces that are giving us monolith actions. So that is very cool. And we have a ton of choices here for where to put our monolith. We have no food or tools, but we do have a couple of cards that are giving us some tools. I tell you what, let's get a bunch of cards in our hand because there's no limit to how many cards you can have in your hand. And that will give us a lot of flexibility for putting out a ton of labor, being able to do a bunch of stuff. So let's go here. That'll let us draw two cards. And then for our second monolith, ooh, do I want that food? Or do I just want more? Oh, or do I want the tools? <laughs> Having a lot of tools would actually be really helpful. Okay, I'm going for the tools actually. So there we go. That was all the actions on the board. Now on our player board, look at this, we get to draw a card because we got that village out and we get another tool. Maybe I should have gone for the food because now we don't have any food. So there you go, that's the eclipse phase done. We're now going to go to the preparation for the next round. We're going to take all of the Nomad's action cards, we're going to shuffle them together to form his deck. We're going to return all of our figures. Oh, there he is. We would refill the hunting ground, but nobody took any uh, animals, so we'll just leave that as it is. We're just going to refill our culture market here. We're still in era one. But now we take this and we put it on top of the Arrow 1 deck. We're now drawing from Era 2 in the future. We then get to draw five more cards into our hand. Not up to five, we get to draw five more cards. Now, my deck is empty, so we take the discard pile, shuffle it. And I get five more. One, two, three, four, five. So I have an enormous number of cards in my hand at the moment. <laughs> and there we go. We are ready for round two.